Hello and welcome to another episode of Locked on Wolves. Today on the show, let's break down Kyle Anderson, the Timberwolves' brand new sixth man, what he'll bring to the team this year as the next part of our roster preview series, plus a little bit of D'Angelo Russell talk. I, I want to talk a little bit about what the rest or what the season could look like for him. Is there really a chance that they trade him or extend him during the season? What might that look like this year for the Wolves as they introduce uh, really, you know, an entirely new rotation with a new sixth man, Rudy Gobert, et cetera. What impact will that have on D'Lo? It's all coming up the show here today. Welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves. Your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Happy Monday, everybody. Hopefully you had a fantastic weekend. We are back daily this week, by the way, Monday through Friday, every day of the week as media day is today, Monday, and uh, train camp kicks off Tuesday. We're just a couple of weeks away from the first preseason game. Uh, right here off the top, a big thank you, first of all, for making Locked On Wolves your first listen each and every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms from Apple to Google, Spotify to Odyssey. You can also follow this show on Twitter at Locked on T-Wolves and at my account, which is at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C-K-E-N. All right, we are a little more than halfway through the, the season preview series where we're doing um, anywhere from you know a segment of a show to a full show on every player on the Timberwolves roster to, to kind of preview what the expectations are for each player this season. And today we're just going to do Kyle Anderson. We're we're all the way to now the top six players who I project will be the top six player players in the Wolves rotation. So we'll talk Kyle Anderson today, and then I want to close with some D'Lo talks. We'll spend roughly half the show on on Kyle and and half the show on D'Lo. Um, just just some. I think the D'Lo thing is really interesting, and and it's it's easy to lose sight of the fact that he's a free agent after this year. And we've talked about it a little on the show, but it's been a while, and and uh, there really hasn't been much chatter related to a potential extension. Obviously, not much trade chatter. So could that be weird this year? And what are really the range of possibilities for D'Lo uh, and, and his future with the Wolves, at least in the next nine months or so? So that'll be the show here today. So let's start with Kyle Anderson. Um, Kyle Anderson, of course, was added in free agency right before the Timberwolves completed the trade for Rudy Gobert. And I, I don't think there's any question that he's going to be the sixth man on this team. I'd be surprised if he starts. I think Jade McDaniels is probably the starting three and Carl Anthony Towns is the starting four. Kyle Anderson is a better fit as a kind of a swing forward that can play both the three and the four. Although you look back at his career, certainly the the latter half of remember he spent four years in San Antonio, four years in Memphis and the latter half of his time in Memphis, he mostly played the four after for the first six years of his career as a small forward. Now with teams going, you know, small ball and he's shown the ability to guard multiple positions. He actually spent according to basketball reference, almost a third of his minutes last year were actually as a small ball center with Memphis um, and of course, they had that interesting front court, um, you know, Jaron Jackson Jr. kind of being in and out of the lineup and um, whether it was injury and then foul trouble and all that stuff, you know, consistently in foul trouble. So that kind of Memphis just has a really unique roster. And I don't know that Kyle's going to play a lot of center with the Timberwolves, given that they have two of the best four centers in the entire league on their roster. Um, but it the positional flexibility of Kyle Anderson to play the three, the four or the five. I think the most likely scenario is he comes off the bench as the primary backup at the power forward spot. And I think he probably plays 22 to 24 minutes per game. He was about 21 minutes a game last year in Memphis. He's played as many as 29 a game in his career back when he was a starter, when he first signed in Memphis four years ago. Um, I think he's probably in the 22 to 24 range as really kind of a true sixth man, not your traditional, you know, scorer uh, in, in a six man role. That's more of the Jalen Noel microwave scorer, you know, get you a bucket whenever you need it. That's not Kyle Anderson. He's more of a well-rounded player that can step in and do whatever you need him to do at any point in time. And that's, but, but I think in terms of minutes, he sees more consistent minutes per game. He probably ends up sixth on this team in minutes, you know, you know, minutes per game. We'll say, you know, not knowing what injuries will look like this year, but um, I see him as, as the first guy off the bench in the front court to spell either Carl Anthony Towns or Rudy Gobert, depending on foul trouble, depending on what Chris Finch's rotation actually looks like this year. Um, I think the ideal scenario is going to be town, you know, Gobert gets the first rest, maybe call it five minutes left in the first quarter. And Anderson comes in at the four town slides to the five, where obviously he's played his entire career, very comfortable there. 
and say the second quarter starts, Rudy comes back at the five and Towns goes to the bench. Kyle Anderson stays in at the four um, and plays another stretch of minutes. And then eventually you play both Towns and Gobert again together, middle part of the second quarter, maybe towards the end of the first half, Anderson comes back in the game. And, and again, depending on foul trouble matchups, et cetera, who's playing better, that whole thing, uh, or any, any of those, you know, numbers of factors, Kyle Anderson could come back in the game and play more minutes at the four next to one of those guys at the five. So you're essentially going to have this three man big rotation in my mind at the, at the four and the five between Gobert towns and Anderson towns and Gobert are going to be in the 32 to 33, 34 minute per game range. Anderson's going to be in the 22 to 24 minute a game range. And you've got Nas and Nate Knight as kind of your backup five options. If foul trouble becomes an issue. Um, but the idea there is Kyle Anderson can slide in very comfortably and play the four next to either one of those guys. And, uh, you know, he did that with Memphis. You know, we look at Memphis's roster last year and, and Kyle Anderson, you know, played with any number of lineups. He had a lot of success next to Jaron Jackson Jr. If you look at the numbers from last year. And um, I think it'll be really interesting to see exactly what that rotation looks like this year. Um, I think another thing to point out is, is I mentioned earlier, he played small ball five at times last year with Memphis. I, again, I don't think he'll do that a lot in Minnesota, but for some perspective, Remember, I mean, Kyle Anderson's a, he's a big dude, right? He's, he's like what, six, nine wingspan is well over seven feet. He has a lot of length. He's not ultra athletic, right? There's a reason his nickname is slow-mo. Um, but the wingspan and the overall size and the length is huge, but he's not a really big guy. He's not your traditional four, right? There's also a reason he played the three for much of the first six years of his career and, and still does sometimes. Um, but the rebound rate is really impressive. I mean, his rebound rate last season was over. It was exactly 13%. Well, what was Nas Reed's rebound rate last year? 13.3%. He effectively had the same rebound rate as the Timberwolves backup center in Nas Reed. Um, now, Nas is a poor rebounder, a poor defensive rebounder as far as centers go, and it was a little undersized. Kyle Anderson, though, played 30% of his minutes at the five last season um, and, and you know played both forward spots. So the fact that he effectively has the same rebound rate as Nas Reed says a lot about both players. It says Kyle Anderson could be physical. Um, Kyle Anderson can be versatile. He can fill in in a number of different places. And, and Nas Reed is, you know, a, a poor rebounding five. Um, and that it just kind of is what it is. So um, I think that that's a really interesting nugget with Kyle Anderson, too. Let's close out the Kyle Anderson conversation next and uh, talk a little bit about some other things he does well and how he'll slide into this rotation. And then we'll close the show today by talking about D'Angelo Russell and his future with the Wolves. First, though, let's talk about our friends over at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for football betting info this season. Find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis on every game you can find. Uh, BetOnline is the place to go for football betting, as I said, really for anything. But football betting is, is you know, we're what, a third of the way through the college season now? We're week three of the NFL. Um, that's the place to be. Also, again, I keep mentioning this. If you're into betting the NBA win totals, the Timberwolves win total over under is still 48 and a half, which is absurd and and i would definitely recommend hammering the over on the wolves uh win total and now's the time we'll start to see those shift a little with preseason starting here shortly um and for whatever for whatever that's worth which isn't a whole lot with preseason you're going to see those lines shift a bit um so definitely keep track of that over at bet online as always bet online remains your continued source for all your sport wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sport out there the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events including mlb mma boxing and golf Head to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. All right, back to the Kyle Anderson conversation. So I think he's legit the sixth man. I think he plays 22 to 24 minutes a game. I think he's the primary option at the four. Next to both Towns and Gobert, I think the fit may actually be a little better with Towns. I think when Towns is at the five, Finch is going to want Anderson at the four quite a bit because of his defensive chops. Now, the the advanced metrics aren't super kind to Kyle Anderson's season last year with Memphis, but remember, he mostly came off the bench. He was a starter, you know, with their starting unit a couple of years ago. Last year, he mostly came off the bench, and a lot of times he was paired with guys who weren't great perimeter defenders, um, and that can have an impact on some of those advanced metrics. Two years ago, he was one of the best small forwards in the league, you know, listed as a small forward 
Um, he was what uh, sixth in in in, in uh, ESPN defensive real plus minus, which I think is a, a pretty good metric when it comes to trying to define individual defense. Um, again, the number wasn't as good last year, but he played a lot more at the four. He played some at the five, which which created some noise there. And again, the weird lineups, the injuries in Memphis, um, and you know I think some of that is to blame. He was given some pretty difficult assignments um, in, in Memphis last season as well. Um, and Taylor Jenkins, the head coach of the Grizzlies, really relied upon him in a lot of different scenarios with the Wolves. He's not going to be asked to be the primary, you know, defensive guy on the perimeter. He's not going to be getting the toughest matchups every night. That's Jaden McDaniels. It's a primary ball handler. That's the or excuse me, not the angel Russell. Hopefully it's not the Russell. It's Anthony Edwards, right? Anthony Edwards and Jaden McDaniels are going to be the primary stoppers on the perimeter. Kyle Anderson is going to be asked to play outstanding team defense. He's a much better team defender than he is one on one. Um, he's a better defender than Torian Prince, certainly as a team defender. Um, the, he's not quite as athletic as Prince, but he's a little bit longer. He's a little bit bigger. He's going to be asked to kind of help Towns. And depending on what pick and roll coverage is, it, it remains to be seen if Finch switches up pick and roll coverages based on the personnel in the game, which would make a lot of sense. But last year, the Wolves, you know, blitz pick and rolls like 90% of the time for the first three quarters of the season until they started to mix in a few other coverages. They mixed in some drop. They started switching a bunch late in the season when teams were figuring out the blitzing coverage. I think the Wolves will play a ton of drop this year with Rudy Gobert in the game, right? Where he's he's sinking into the paint and he's he's essentially making life difficult for the opposing offense with his length, his ability to, to guard multiple places on the floor. Carl Anthony Towns is bad in drop coverage. So when Rudy's off the floor, I would imagine that the Wolves may switch switched to more of a blitzing scheme, which Ant was good at, Towns was good at. It helped hide D'Lo a little bit defensively. Or they may try something different, right? And Kyle Anderson's a really good switchable defender. He's going to be great in a switching scheme. Uh, you know, ideally, he's the one mixed up in pick and roll versus Towns if the two of them are on the floor. But opposing teams may hunt Towns, depending on the coverage the Wolves are trying to play. When Again, when Rudy's off the floor. So Kyle Anderson's going to be relied upon to be a, a safety net for Towns to try and hide, not hide Cat, because again, he he was okay defensively the last couple of seasons, really the last season and a half or so. Um, but Kyle Anderson, I think safety net is the best way to put it. Um, put, put what, what Chris Finch thinks he'll get from Kyle Anderson defensively. He's going to be able to do multiple things and, and really help Carl Anthony towns out. Um, offensively, he can initiate offense if he needs to, with the second unit, if he's out there with say Anthony Edwards playing at the second unit or Jalen Noel, any one of those guys can initiate offense. He's really Anderson's a very well-rounded player can do everything at an average or above level, except for shoot threes. Um, he's a, he's a, a tick below league league average when it comes to three point shooting. And he didn't shoot all that many last year for his career is 33%, which I guess is more than a tick below league average, which is around 36 nowadays. He did shoot 36% two years ago, but last year he was 33% for his career. He's 33%. And that's probably what we can expect for him um, to see to see from him this year. So he will be a bit of a weak link in terms of perimeter shooting, but he does everything else at an average or above average level. Um, and is really kind of the perfect Swiss army knife role player for this roster. And, and frankly, for most rosters around the league, I would imagine there were a lot of teams interested in bringing him in uh, because he is capable of doing so many different things. And then of course, from a leadership perspective, from a veteran perspective, all those intangibles that are a little bit more difficult to, to really to measure them. Right. Um, he's been a part of several playoff teams. He's played for two really good organizations in San Antonio and Memphis. He's been in the playoffs in, um, I believe in, in six of his eight years or maybe five of his eight years, uh, you know, three years in San Antonio, a couple years in Memphis. So I think, I think five of his eight seasons he's played in the playoffs. So a very well-rounded veteran player that can do multiple things. And we'll see a ton of minutes for this Wolves team. I think it's a little bit of an underrated signing um, nationally. Nobody's really talking about it. And I get it, He's a role player. But that's one of those incremental, you know, improvements that's that's going to happen that did happen to this roster that will have that incremental impact. Um, you know, the national talking heads aren't going to talk. The Rudy's the headliner, right? And Ant and Cat and, and rightfully so. But this is where some of the real improvements going to happen. In addition to that, it's it's going to shore up the rest of the roster. He's a better defender than say, obviously Malik Beasley. He brings more to the table offensively than Patrick Beverly because he's more versatile. He can guard more positions than some of these other guys that have been shipped out. He's a better all around player than Jared Vanderbilt. Um, all of that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, and, uh, and and I think he's going to have a massive impact on the team this season. So that's something to keep an eye on. You know what his exact role is. Uh, let's go ahead and cruise right into the D'Angelo Russell conversation, and that's how we'll close the show here today. Because um, there's actually an article on Bleacher Report. It's one of those you know throwing trades against the wall, see what sticks. Hopefully, you know slower news cycle for the NBA overall. Um, you know, so let's let's talk about trades, right? 
So that caught my eye. It was actually like towards the end of last week. There was a blockbuster trade ideas for the season by Greg Sports over at Bleacher Report. There were five different trades listed. One involved the Timberwolves and it involved the Angel Russell. So it got me thinking, you know, hey, we haven't really talked about him much on the podcast since kind of free agency started in July when there were a few D'Angelo Russell rumors out there like, hey, the Wolves are open to trading D'Lo. There was the whole, hey, I'm being shopped. You know, uh, D'Lo was did his thing on social media and there wasn't a whole lot of uh, positive D'Lo talk around the Timberwolves. Now that's flipped, of course, and I would not expect, I want to be very clear, I do not expect D'Angelo Russell to be traded before the season in the next three weeks. I think that would be a huge boat rocker right before the season and a team that's already had so much change bringing in an all-star and Rudy and trading out, you know, uh, some significant rotation pieces from last year. So I don't think Delo is about to get traded, but I think it's important to talk about what does the situation look like? He's a player in a max deal that expires next summer. It does not have an extension. He's a massive unrestricted uh, or a massive expiring contract and would is scheduled to be an unrestricted free agent next summer. What are the wolves going to do with that? Is there a chance he gets traded during the season? Is he, I'm going to get an extension during the season. Is it a complete wait and see? So I want to give my two cents on that. And also, I, I do want to talk about this Bleacher trade, Bleacher Report uh, uh, suggested trade because I don't hate the idea. I just don't think, like, from a if, if this were NBA 2K, like, hey, this might make some sense, actually. But given that it's not, and it's real life, and there's personalities involved, and there's team chemistry involved... Um, and you've already changed so much of the roster out, I don't think it makes sense. So I want to break that down just a little bit here, and that's how we'll close the show today. All right, so uh, talking about D'Angelo Russell, the possibility of D'Lo uh, potentially being traded... I don't think it happens this season, right? I, I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense for the Wolves to rock the boat further. Uh, well, I shouldn't say further, but to rock the boat on top of what they've already done. Um, I, I think the far more likely scenario is that they play out the string with D'Angelo Russell this season. Um, and, and play out the string is also probably not the right term. I think deal is a big part about what a big part of what this team wants to do this season, right? Going back to the Gerson Rosas years, there's the there's the D'Lo cat friendship. There's the D'Lo cat pick and roll pairing. I think that even if he's not like, like if you were signing D'Angelo Russell right now as a free agent, I don't think anybody in the league gives him a maximum contract, right? That's not, that's not, D'Lo is not a max contract player. However, we talked about this on Friday's show. He was ranked by ESPN in the 90s with the ESPN rank. That's far too low. D'Angelo Russell is a starting point guard in this league. He's a, probably a top 16, 18 point guard. We talked about he was outside the top 22 on CBS. That's too low there too. I also think the actual on-court fit beyond the, the friendship piece with D'Lo and Cat makes makes a ton of sense also with rudy gobert um rudy gobert is a, is a huge uh a huge um impact in pick and roll game right um he, one of the league's best rollers fantastic when he's diving to the rim the metrics all say that he's one of the best in the league at it and he hasn't played i mean mike conley obviously a good and we'll talk more about him in a second actually spoiler alert with this potential you know trade from bleacher report uh, mike conley's a good pick and roll point guard he played gobert played with uh ricky rubio for a couple of years in Utah as well. Uh, so he's played with some good pick and roll guards, but play, not playmakers to the level of D'Angelo Russell in his prime. D'Angelo Russell had a good season last year. It was arguably his best season since his, his Brooklyn All-Star year. And I've made the case before on the show, I thought he was every bit as good last season as he was when he made the All-Star team as an injury replacement four years ago in Brooklyn. D'Lo's passing took a step up last year because Anthony Edwards took a step up offensively. The Wolves asked him to create more. They asked him to initiate more in the half court. And he did that. Um, and I think if he continues to play that role this season, you're going to see the assist rate tick up. You're going to see the turnover rate probably tick up a little because he's going to be passing more. You're going to see his usage rate tick down. Um, and I think D'Lo understands. D'Lo's a really intelligent player. He knows that he's still going to get paid. If the Wolves win and the assist numbers go up and the efficiency goes up for him, his shooting numbers weren't great last year. He shoots less but the efficiency goes up, the assist numbers go up. He's going to get paid this offseason. He's not going to get another max contract. Nobody's going to give him a max contract. But this is a contract year for D'Angelo Russell. And the way he gets paid is the team wins and he gets a bunch of assists. D'Lo's a smart guy. He knows that. And I'm sure that he and Chris Finch have talked about it. Um, and D'Lo, D'Lo obviously knows this is a contract year. So all those things are in his best interest and in the team's best interest. It's highly unlikely he gets traded this season unless the first half of the year is a complete disaster and things just don't go as expected then who knows? Um, this proposed trade from Bleacher Report has the Wolves getting 
Mike Conley from Utah and Kendrick Nunn from the Lakers. Of course, Kendrick Nunn didn't play at all last season. It also has them getting a second round pick from the Lakers. And it would have D'Lo and Jordan Clarkson and Rudy Gay going to the Lakers, Russell Westbrook to be bought out by the Jazz, and a first round pick going from LA to the Jazz. So at first glance, I hated this trade because Mike Conley is obviously on the wrong side of his career. He's going to turn 35 this season. Kendrick Nunn didn't play last year, but the more I thought about it, you get two seasons of Mike Conley. Again, I'm not advocating for the Wolves to do this. I just think this is the type of thing that could happen, the type of trade return that could make sense. You'd get two years of Mike Conley, who's at this point a below, he's not a below average defender. He's not where he was, right? He was once one of the best perimeter point guard defenders in the league. Um, he's now probably average at best, but he's a little better than D'Lo. He's certainly better than D'Lo defensively. Kendrick Nunn is a is a true kind of six man type combo guard that can do multiple things, can make threes, um, and you get you don't have to worry about giving D'Angelo Russell that big contract because what's D'Lo looking for? If he's not look if he's still looking for a max, you're not going to be able to bring him back. If you can bring him back at a at a lucrative contract that isn't a max deal, then I think you do that too. But if it, if if push comes to shove and it comes down to like, hey, we can't do this, you know, we got we got to move on from D'Lo because he wants this max contract. Maybe it's a sign and trade. Maybe it is some sort of a, you know, I, I just, I, I don't see them trading him at the deadline because this is a team that should be in the top four or five in the West at that point. And that would be a massive trade to move on from your max contract starting point guard at the deadline. Um, so all that to say, this is the type of return that would check multiple boxes. It would improve your perimeter defense. You wouldn't lose that much in terms of shooting on the perimeter. You'd bring in a lower usage guy in Conley, not low usage, but lower than D'Lo. So technically that would work. That fit works. And obviously Conley and Rudy played together with mixed results over the past couple of few seasons. Um, and then you get another score off the bench in Kendrick Nunn. So if you think Jalen Noel is leaving in free agency next summer, maybe that's something you could do. Um, I think the most likely scenario is D'Lo plays the entire year and they work out some sort of an extension late in the season, similar to the Patrick Beverly extension last year, hopefully for more than a season, but where, you know, D'Lo gets paid, the Wolves maintain some flexibility. They don't sign the max deal. They still have the ability to extend both Anthony Edwards and Jade McDaniels, who are both on the rookie contracts, will be up for extensions soon. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the season, it, perhaps it's a, a modest Modest as in not a max D'Lo extension. And then you can worry about McDaniels and you can worry about Anthony Edwards. And you bring D'Lo back on a, on a modest deal. Again, I go back to D'Lo knowing it's in his best interest all the way around for the team to win, for him to put up good assist numbers and to just be a little more selective and efficient offensively. And if he can do that, he's going to get paid, whether it's by the Timberwolves or if they, he moves on next summer, the Wolves, you know, get their cap space and D'Lo leaves. That's not ideal. But that's a possibility that could happen. Um, and it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world um, if, if the Wolves determine, hey, we're not going to clog our cap with a max deal again for D'Lo. You know, we're just we're just going to let him move on. Uh, that's always a possibility, too. So all, all things are certainly possible here, but it's highly unlikely D'Lo is traded at any point unless things really go south for the team in the first half of the season. Then all bets are off, of course. Um, but the most likely scenario, I think, is some sort of an extension late in the season uh, before he actually hits free agency next summer. Um, but it'll certainly be something to keep an eye on. I don't think we'll hear much in the way of rumors. And that's why I wanted to bring it up now, because this is kind of going to kind of be a low key storyline for the first part of the year, unless the team struggles and then it becomes more, more to the forefront. Right. Um, but keep an eye on D'Lo, keep an eye on his season. Don't forget this is a contract year. Expect him to be, um, to have a very good season. I, I think that he's finally comfortable in his role and he gets along with Chris Finch. Um, and he could have a really big season for the wolves. All right, training camp starts tomorrow. It starts Tuesday. We'll get into the rest of the player reviews this week. We'll talk about anything big from Media Day on Monday that comes out. Um, any any you know significant quotes from the players or coaches, and then we'll focus on the on the starting lineup the rest of the week with season previews, and then we get into preseason basketball. So it's all coming together now. It's all happening. We're finally there. We're to basketball season. So uh, be sure. And by the way, another reminder: we're daily the rest of this week. So Monday through Friday now, moving forward through the rest of the season and really into next July. So uh, make sure you're following and subscribe to Lockdown Wolves wherever you listen to podcasts. It's free and available everywhere, including Apple, Google, Spotify, and of course, YouTube. You can also follow on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast. Um, and a reminder you can make your second listen to the Lockdown Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Josh Lloyd hosts the number one daily fantasy basketball show on the planet. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.